Amen. Father, I thank you that all creation cries out that there's a creator. Lord, and we are your creation as well. And so we're called to cry out that there's a creator. So Lord, even now, we just thank you that you made us in the first place. That even though uh, many have fallen, uh, all of us have, uh, fall short of your glory, that you didn't cancel the project. That, that you kept loving us to the point of giving your life to purchase us back. That we again could cry out to you, Abba Daddy. We just thank you, Lord, for the privilege to be able to be called sons and daughters of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. How's everyone this morning? Good to see you here today. How many people were encouraged through worship? Amen. I know, you know, we do it online. I'm sure some of you have heard it online. We do our best to have the worship go online, but I know it doesn't sound the same as being here. So if you're watching online, I'm telling you, you just need to be here, right? You live local, come to church. Amen. I want to begin by sharing a story with you. Back a few years ago, and so you know, bear with me as I give you a little bit of background, but my older brother uh, had some chickens on, on the farm that I was on, and so he was going on a trip. So he decided that he was going to entrust the care of these chickens to my two sons. At the time, that they're now like 30-something, but at the time... Uh, one was seven or eight, and the other was about five or six. And so that was, Jonathan was the little one, the guy that you just saw do the announcements, and then the older one was Alexander. Now, you see John as this really nice, uh, friendly kind of person that, you know, wouldn't hurt a fly, right? But let me tell you something. In those days, he was an instigator. He got his older brother in so much trouble. It's unbelievable. And once we figured it out, then the older brother didn't get into as much trouble. But before we knew that, you know, Alexander was just getting, you know, like, Alex, why did you do this? He's like, I don't know. But in the end, it was Jonathan. So just watch him. Yeah, Jonathan. Anyways, so make a, let me move on with this. So their job was to feed the chickens, water them, and collect the eggs. That was their job. And so they started, you know, it, it, this was like about eight or ten days. It was a long time that they were away. So day one, you know, they, they go out to the barn, and we saw them go, and they come back a little while later, and they got the little bucket, and they had about... 20-ish eggs in there, quite a few eggs, right? So we put them in the fridge, and then day two comes along, and they were a little bit longer than day one. But the funny thing is there was less eggs the second day, you know, just a couple less. And then day three, same deal. They were a little bit longer, but less eggs. And so we began to question them and say, you know, what's up? You know, what's going on? So they, they started telling us different stories. Uh, and so one of them was, well, there was a bunch of them that were cracked and broken, so we just threw them away. Oh, okay. And then, you know, as there was less and less and less each day, it was like, well, maybe a raccoon stole them. You know, they're coming up with these stories. You know, well, maybe they're just not laying so many. So the final day, they brought like three eggs. Like there wasn't even enough to cover the bottom of the bucket, you know. And so I'm like, something is up here. So the next day, I follow them out, unbeknownst to them. In other words, they don't know I'm following them. So I just come along, and I'm watching. And so I see them go in. I see them feed the chickens. I see them water the chickens. And I see them collect a whole lot of eggs. In fact, their bucket was right full. But then I see them come out of the barn. And in the front of our barn, we had this, it was kind of like a little pond. There was a bunch of water there. And I see them taking these eggs and going, whoop, and just treating them like little rocks, you know, and say, so take these beautiful white, you know, fresh eggs and just throwing them into the water. And they're just disappearing under the water. And, you know, about that time, I show up on the scene. Now, let me tell you something. Their lives were not good for the next month or so. Let's just, let's just put it that way, right? And I'm like, what's going on here? You know, like, so literally they were caught, what, red-handed, you know, <laughs> holding the eggs. And, and they like, uh, and so, so the, here's what they're going to tell you now. Now, they didn't tell me this at the time. Here's what they're going to tell you. If you ask John after, hey, what was, what's the story behind the story? They're going to tell you that they were performing science experiments to see whether eggs would float. Now, here's the deal. How many eggs do you need to do that test? Like, they probably wasted about 60 eggs. You know what I'm saying? The point is, let me tell you, that story doesn't float, all right? So it's just they've had a few years to think about it to try to, you know, justify what they did wrong. So my point in bringing that story up is this. They were caught red-handed. You and I don't want to be caught red-handed. You know, last week I talked about the return of the Lord, that, you know, he is going to come back one day. And, and in a sense, what is in our hand? And that's what I want to talk to you about today. What is in your hand and what is in my hand? In other words, God has given us something. And the question is, what are we doing with it? 
And so with that in mind, I encourage you to turn to Exodus, Exodus chapter 14. And as you're turning there, I'm going to be reading from New King James Version. So if you're going to your apps, you can dial that in. But uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about Moses. And I need to give you just a little background before we hit the little scripture we're going to be looking at. So Moses was the man of God, called by God to deliver the children of Israel up out of Egypt. All right? So he'd been a shepherd for, for 40 years out in the wilderness, and, and God miraculously shows up and says, hey, Moses, I'm calling you to do this. And so Moses is a little bit tentative about it. He, he doesn't know whether he should do it or not. But in the end, he signs up for the program. And he says, okay, I'll do this. So he goes there. There's signs and wonders. You know, you got plagues happen. You know, all kinds of crazy things happen. The Nile River turns to blood. You know, frogs and locusts and lice. The, the list goes on and on of all the stuff that happens there. But in the end, Pharaoh says, okay, I'll let you go. So, so Moses begins to lead them up, and they, they are out for several days. They get to the Red Sea. And at that point, there's no other place to go. There's a mountain on one side, there's the Red Sea, and then there's the road going back to Egypt. So that's, that's where they are. And then Pharaoh decides, I'm not letting these people go. What was I thinking? And so he gets his armies together and his chariots, and he comes after them. So we're going to pick up the story where basically they're stuck right there at the edge of the sea, no place to go forward. They can't go backwards, and they know Pharaoh and his armies are coming, and they're not happy. So let's pick up at verse 13. So Exodus 14, beginning at verse 13. And Moses said to the people, Don't be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. And the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry out to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward, but lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Let's go back to verse, verse uh, right, right at the start, verse 13. So as you look at this, Moses says to be, so he sees everything that's happening. He's the leader, right? You know, he, he's, he's the president, you know, call him what you want. He is the boss. And so he says to the people, look, don't be afraid. He says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. So here's what he's saying. He's saying, look, you don't have to do anything. You just, just hang tight. It's all going to be good. God's going to deliver you. All is good, right? Okay. Let me just tell you right now. If the, that had ended there, we probably wouldn't have the story of most of the Old Testament. In other words, if everybody did nothing, especially Moses, it, the story would have ended there. Let's look at the next verse. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. And so basically he's saying, look, God's going to do it all. He's going to do everything for you. Then verse 15, what does it say? The Lord says to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward, but lift up your rod, stretch out your hand, and over the sea, and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go forward on dry ground in the midst of the sea. I want you to see a couple of things here that are really, really important. First of all, just because you are a believer in Christ doesn't mean that you don't play a part in your faith walk. You hear what I'm saying? This is really important. I can't tell you how many Christians tell me, well, I'm a child of God, so therefore everything's going to be okay. God's going to look after me. Well, here's, here's, here's what I can tell you. If you're a child of God, when you die, you get to go to heaven. That's promised. Well, what about the rest of life? The rest of life, we have to have a part in it. We play a part. And literally, that's what's happening here. And this is what I want you to see to apply to today in your life. You know, this is more than a history lesson. I don't want it to be about history. I want it to be about right here and right now. Because God, just as God put in Moses' hand a rod to do something, God has put something in your hand as well. And so as we look at this, the Lord says to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Now that word crying, this, this is, it's one of, the most, one of the more intense words in the Old Testament. It means, why are you shrieking out in terror at me? Now picture this. You have these people, better part of a million people, they're right there wedged against the sea and the mountains. There's no other place to go. Pharaoh and his armies are coming, and they know that probably certain death is awaiting them. They're not saying, oh, God, will you please help us? No, they're screaming their lungs out. They're crying out, God, we need you. They're, they're literally wailing and screaming. And then... 
God says, why are you doing this? Why are you shrieking out at me? Tell the children to go forward. Now, if I was Moses, I'd be like, uh, God, you know, can't you see, you know, we got the sea, we got the mountain. There is no going forward. See, that's where faith comes in for you and I. You see, there are times where you have to call things as though they are, even though you can't see them. Anybody with me on this? See, that's what faith is. You know, if God opens the door, all you can do is say thank you then, right? But we are called to be a people of faith. And that means that you and I at times have to speak things as God tells us and speak them out and act upon them, even though it looks like there's a sea in front of us and a mountain around us. And that's a difficult thing for you and I. As humans, we like to see the door open, and then we're like, hey, thank you, Jesus. And then we walk through it. And God does that sometimes, doesn't he? But there are other times that he wants, to, wants us to grow from what? Faith to faith, from glory to glory. And in doing that, that means there's a stretching that has to happen. And for that to happen, we've got to stop crying out to him and begin to obey him. In other words, God was saying, hey, Moses, if you stay here and keep scree screaming at me, guess what? You're going to get rolled over by an army. You're going to be toast. But if you do what I tell you to do, if you act in what I'm giving you to do, then that won't happen. Here's my point. God won't do the part you're called to do. Everybody hear that? God won't do the part that you've been called to do. He'll do the supernatural part. He'll give you the instructions. He'll do all that. But in the end, you have to take that step of faith. And that's challenging. It is for me anyways. Is it challenging for anybody else out there? It is. Because often the ocean is right there. The mountains are right there. It looks like there is no way. But doesn't the scripture say this? God makes a way where there seemeth to be no way. Come on. You know, that's God, right? But the thing is, do we believe that? And are we willing to follow his instructions? So here's what God says. Lift up your rod, stretch it out over the sea and divide it. Now let me tell you something. Moses had never done this before. As far as parting a sea. And yet God asked them to do it. And, and if we go on and read, we'll see that it really happened. They got to safety. The Egyptians tried to follow them. The waves and ocean all caved in on them, and they all died and perished. And so it really happened. But Moses had to act in faith. So what about this rod thing? You know, if I, if I was a person just coming to the Lord and not knowing the whole of Scripture... I would say, well, what is that, like a wizard wand or, or a, you know, a fairy wand? Or, you, know, you know, what was special or magic about the stick that he was carrying around? Well, why don't we take a few minutes and actually look at this and see how it applies to you and I today? Because you and I have something in our hands as well, spiritually speaking. And so as we, we move on from this, we need to understand a little bit about what that rod was. Well, the word rod in that scripture that we just read represents a it can be a stick. It literally can just mean stick. It can mean a scepter. All right? So in other words, like a ruling person would have this, someone in authority. But it also can mean, and this is going to be a little confusing when I say this, but when I explain it, I think you'll get it. It can mean a tribe. You're like, what? What's, what, what is that? Well, here's the thing. That rod that is being talked about there, that was actually the same staff, rod staff, because they're called the same thing, that Moses had when he was in the wilderness, looking after sheep. So let's talk about this in the natural, first of all. A staff has two purposes. One end of it was really pointy, and it was designed to be a weapon, right? The, you know, to, to keep wolves and, and to keep, you know, lions and bears away from the sheep, and maybe even people, right? Robbers who were trying to take the sheep. So it was a, this weapon to protect the sheep. But the other end of it was what? You know, come on, how many manger scenes have you seen, right? You know, the shepherd's there. It's got the little crook on the, on the top, right? The little hook. Well, what's that all about? Well, the idea is that if a sheep gets into a hole or, or over a, an embankment somewhere where, where the shepherd can't get to, he literally can take that shepherd's staff and the hook is just the right size to hook around their neck and be able to pull them up to safety. And so the staff serves two purposes, right? It's a, it's a weapon as well as a tool to guide the sheep as well. And so we have that going on. All right. In a few moments, I'm going to explain to you the significance for you and I, but we need to look at one more scripture. Can we do that together? If you have your Bibles, again, go to Psalms 23. Famous Psalm, right? Where, where David is talking about, you know, the Lord being his shepherd. I just want to look at just a couple of verses there. So Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. 
He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So let's go back, at, uh, back up to verse 1 and 3. So as you look at this, first of all, it's defined very easily. Who is our shepherd? Everybody's got this figured out, right? The Lord is. And for us today, obviously, we're going to say Jesus. In fact, in the New Testament, everywhere, it says that Jesus, it uses terms like this, bishop and overseer of our souls. Different versions say that. But you actually could read it, and some versions say this, he's the chief shepherd over us. And so literally, that's who it is for you and I. And so he, David goes on and says, I shall not want. In other words, as we allow the Lord to be our shepherd, we will not have need. We may have greeds, right? We may have other things, but our needs will be met according to the riches and glory which are found in Christ Jesus. That, that's straight from the scriptures. And then David goes on and says, he makes me to lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside still waters. Okay, there's something about sheep. You can't make a sheep lay down unless they are stuffed full and they've had enough water and they're just ready to have a nap. That's the only way. In other words, if they're still hungry, if they still feel a need, they still need water, you can't make them lay down even if you like yank their legs out and lay them. They'll just pop back up again. That's, just, that's what they do. And the thing is, that's the same for us as well. And so as we look at this, he makes me to lie down. That means that you are willing to because you're satisfied. Listen, when we abide under the shepherd, we will be satisfied. Now, the question is, do you believe it? Because I hate to say this, but so often for us as Christians living in this world, we're running after all kinds of things, feeding on all kinds of things that are not the things that God has called us to feed upon. And what happens is then we have more discontentment, and it just wrote, and then we're like, God, why, aren't, why, why am I feeling discontent? And he's like, well, are you letting me shepherd you? Are you letting me do what? Have authority over you and guide you. Because that's what the shepherd staff does, right? That's what the shepherd does. And so as we look at this, uh, he restores my soul. See, the whole reason he does all of the above things, makes you to lie down, brings you beside still waters, is so your soul, your mind, your way of thinking might be restored. Now, that word restored is a really cool word. It doesn't mean just restored as in fixed and patched up. It literally means to take it back to its original form, and it's even better than before. So let me give you an example. In our lives, you know, I'm 50-something years old. Oh, I just even hate to think that. 50-something years old. And I've got some, I got some travel experiences. How many people got some travel experiences? In other words, you've got some rough roads that you went over. You've got events and circumstances that happened. Not all good. Anyone with me on this? You know, you had some good things happen too, but you had some things that weren't so good. Now, here's the thing. That word restores. Here's what it means. And I pray that someone here, this is a word of the Lord for you, is that God doesn't just come along and restore you and say, okay, now you're going to be okay. It's going to be fine, even though that thing happened back. You're, you're, it's, you'll work through it. That's not what this word says. It means that he will work that through to such a point that whatever happened, however bad it is, it will be a strong point in your life to be able to help you to be propelled forward. In other words, it will no longer be a negative thing. Can you believe that for yourself right now? Listen to me. This is a big deal. That restoration process is something you have to let the shepherd guide you through. You can't do it your own way. It's like Moses saying, hey, God's going to look after everything. I don't have to do anything. And what was God doing? Man, pick up your staff. Get going. And, and that's the thing. There's a part that we play, but as we do our part, all Moses did was lift up the shepherd's staff. And God parted the sea, right? Did Moses do it? He didn't, no, he just, he just followed what God told him to do, and then the miracle happened. And it's the same for you and I, that no matter what's going on in your life, maybe the sea is on one side, the, the mountain's on the other, and you're up against the wall, you need to find out what God is saying, and when you act upon it, miracles will happen. Seas will part. You know, the enemy will be, be devoured. You will be delivered. That's a promise. It's right in Scripture, amen? And so as we, we move forward with this, there's an interesting thing about this whole rod staff thing. 
You can go right now to museums in Israel, and there's shepherd staffs right there. And so what they found was that they're never just a staff, but there's all kinds of markings on them. And so they did a study into this saying, well, what is all this about? Well, here's what shepherds would do. They would actually put events on that staff. It would become like a journal that we would have today because they didn't have paper and those kinds of things. So they would put like a little mark. So in other words, when a miraculous thing happened, like for example, I'm sure Moses, when he encountered God at the burning bush, I'm sure on that staff was maybe a, a little fire, <laughs> you know, with a circle around it or something, right? So that he could tell his children, you know, look it, this is, this is when that happened. But then different other events, you know, births and deaths and all those kinds of things, events that happen in their life gets recorded. So it becomes like this, this living diary that you're carrying around your entire life. And so it literally becomes, in a sense, a witness of your character, of literally your entire history is on that stick. So here's God saying, Moses, lift up that rod. Lift up who you are and move forward, and I'll work a miracle through you. See, that's what God's calling you and I to do. You see, God wants to restore you. And so your character, what God has made you now, is amazing. Now, you may be working through some things. How many people are still working through some things? Thank you for being honest. I, I got my hand up. I'm not, I should put both hands up. And Sandra always nods, nods her head vigorously when I say God's still working on me. And, and the point is that, that for all of us, God is still working on us. But for what part he has done in us, we can hold it up before the Lord and we can walk in victory. And so we can still be an unfinished product, so to speak, but finished in God to do miracles. Is everyone with me on this? The question is, are you finished enough in God to be obedient? See, that's the catch to this whole thing, isn't it? If Moses didn't believe God just enough, he might have said, we're all going to die. You know what I mean? Throw a stick down, you know, throw a stab. At, we're just dead. We're, and we wouldn't have the historical, you know, account in the word. But he had enough faith to be obedient. Do you have enough faith today? You know, you might not have enough faith in some areas, but you have enough faith today to lift up what God has given you and walk in faith with it. Now, you might say, okay, Pastor Carl, you're, you're kind of, this is woo, kind of out there. I'm going to show you before we're done in the New Testament exactly how this all connects, all right? So you're with me for about two more minutes? Are you good with that? All right, so let me just put this down just on the board here so you can kind of see what's going on. This rod, you know, and they'll put this up, equals authority. That's really what it is, right? Because it's the pointy end. It means that you, you rule. The idea is that you control what's going on. And so Jesus wants to rule and reign over us. And in turn, we're, do, we're to do what? Rule and reign over our circumstances. So what is our basis of our authority? Let me tell you what it is. The basis of our authority is the word of God. All right? This is our authority. This is the ultimate authority. All right, so what's the staff part represent? You know, the staff represents guidance, right? So what, what is that part? It represents the Holy Spirit, right? So in our lives, we have holding in our hands, holding in our lives as a part of who we are. We have the Word of God as our authority, and we have the guidance of the Holy Spirit to be with us. So how does that work? Well, we have the Word of God tells us truth, right? And what does the Holy Spirit do? directs us in that truth, how to act upon it, and then we go ahead and do it. And so in a sense, are we holding out? I don't want anybody to come to church next Sunday with sticks, all right? I don't, nobody bring any staffs, all right? It's not about a physical staff anymore, but it's about what you're holding on to spiritually. Now let me just show you in the New Testament where this, it's, it's like in our faces. You maybe have never seen it before. So here it is, Matthew chapter 28. Jesus has already given his life on the cross, been resurrected from the dead. He's hanging out with his disciples, and he's giving them some final instructions. And this is what he says. Matthew 28, beginning at verse 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching or guiding them, to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the age. So go back to verse 8. Oh, it's all one scripture up here. Okay, so just have a look at this. Who's speaking? This is really important. Jesus. And what does he say about himself? He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. There's two words for the word authority in the Bible. 
All right? One actually talks about the power, the, the miraculous power of God. It's a Greek, Greek word that it means dunamis. That, that's the word in the original Greek. And it means like the dynamite power of God, the miraculous power of God. Then there's another word in the Greek, it's exousia. And that is more like uh, government, to be in, in control. Well, this particular one is, Jesus is saying, I'm in ultimate control. Now, there's lots of other scriptures that says that he has the explosive, miraculous power of God. But in this case, he is in control of governments. He's in control of everything. You might say, I don't see that. Let me tell you, he is. Wait till the Holy Spirit is withdrawn and see what chaos happens down here. All right? God is in control. Now, let's, let's just, let me just, I, I didn't say this at the first service. Here's the thing. God is in control as much as you allow him to be. Did you vote on Tuesday? Just ask him. Don't show me your hand. My point is that God has given you the authority and the ability to control the circumstances here in the natural. If you don't vote, if you're like, ah, they're all crooks or they're all, listen to me. You're doing what Moses did at the start. Ah, God, you're gonna, you're, it's all going to work out if, if I'm not a part of it. That's not true. You want to have a good life down here? We need to be obedient to the Lord. And so it's important to follow his directions, amen? And we have the privilege to vote. Do it, amen? So next time, if you haven't registered, done all that stuff, please do that, and then vote. You know, put, put, it, put your X, your, well, actually, you fill in the little hole, right? Fill it in, do what you need to do. All right, let's move on. That, that's my little rant for, for a few minutes. Till next year, right? Till, or two years from now when, when we're talking about voting again. Here's what I want you to see. All authority has been given. Heaven and earth. Go therefore. So here's what he's done. He's transferred authority, hasn't he? He says, I'm in charge. And now he's saying, you do this. So what has he done? He's given you authority. He's given you a rod, hasn't he? He's given you the ability to do something. And go make disciples, baptize them, you know, do all that. And then he says in verse 20, teaching, and a synonym for teaching, exact synonym, is guiding them to observe all things that I've commanded you. In other words, that's the other end of the shepherd's staff, right? The hook to, to be able to help and to guide people. And you might say, well, look, it, I, I'm not a pastor. Listen to me. We're all called to be shepherds at one level or another. You know, obviously my job here, you know, as, as a shepherd here, is to help you, to guide you, protect you. Like if some crazy person comes in here, you know, and starts saying things that's not scriptural, you know, it's my job to deal with it. Well, not really. I'll get John to deal with it. But, but the point is, somebody will deal with it under my direction, if you know what I'm saying. And, and so, and again, to guide, to teach, and all that. And you might say, but I'm not you, and you're not me. I get that. But listen to me. Let's say you're a, a mom or a dad in a family. You're to shepherd your children. That's your flock. You know, you need to guide them, have authority over them, not control them, manipulate. That's not what I'm saying. But to, but to show them direction and then guide them when they need that. What about at work? You may be the lowest person on the totem pole at work, but as a child of God, you've been given authority. And so don't go by the title as low man on the totem pole, but rather you go with the title, I am a child of God. I've got authority, and, and I can use that to help the people around me. So don't go by job titles as far as what you can do or can't do. God's given you a title. You know what that title says? Child of the Most High God. And you've been given, we just read the scripture, you've been given authority and the ability to teach or guide others around you. And so don't think, oh, I got to have my life perfect before I do that. That, is, that means that we might as well just pack up, shut the lights off and go home. Because there's no one perfect here, right? No one perfect. We're working towards that. We're perfect in Christ. Our spirit's been made perfect. But as far as our mind, we're still working it through. We wouldn't be here having a conversation if that wasn't true. Right? We talk about things, we, we, we look at the scriptures, we reason about the scriptures to help us bring us to a more complete place in Christ. Amen? All right. So what's in your hand this morning? Let's stand together as we close in prayer. What is in your hand is both the Word of God and the Holy Spirit of God. Not in your physical hand, but in you. That's what you have to hold up. That's what God has called you and I to hold up in this world. Our job is to connect heaven and earth. That's our job. And we do that by walking in authority. You know, a term that's used, it's, it's the believer's authority. So how do you pray? 
Do you pray like Moses was before he did anything, screaming and shrieking to God? Or do you come in and you hear from God and then you go out from his presence and then you speak what needs to be done? When you pray for someone, are you begging God to do a miracle in their life? Let me tell you something. If you're doing that, probably nothing's going to happen. You know why? The enemy's looking down saying, ha, 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 they don't even know what authority they have. They don't even think they got it, so they're still begging for it. Years ago, God spoke to me about this and, and showed me I was crying out about something, and he, he yelled at me, just kind of like how Moses got yelled at. And, and I gave permission for God to yell at me. Just so you know, you have to give permission for that, all right? But I said, God, whatever you need to tell me, tell me. And so he yelled at me. He said, son, what are you doing? I'm like, well, I'm, you know, I'm just praying about this. He says, why are you talking to me about it? I paid the price on the cross of Calvary. By my stripes, you have been healed. So why are you talking to me? Talk to the circumstance. And so what we need to do as believers is to take what God's told us through the authority of his word, by the anointing of the Holy Spirit, as we've heard from him, turn from him, and then go speak to the circumstance, just like Moses did. God spoke to him. He then turned, held up the rod. The sea was separated, just like that. That's exactly what you and I are called to do today. That's what God wants from you and I. But are we willing to, by faith, act upon his word? So, Father, I thank you for every person here. And, Lord, I see men and women of faith just rising up. In fact, I pray this message has encouraged them to get a little further down the road with you in their faith walk. That, Lord God, now when circumstances happen, they won't just say, well, I'm just going to wait and see what God does. I'm just, I'm just believing. But rather they will say, God, what, what's my part? Because, Lord, you're not going to do the part you've called us to do. So, Lord, that we would ask you what that part is. <laughs> and then when we know in our hearts what to do, we'll do our part. And then you'll do the miraculous part. And we'll be able to glorify your name. <laughs> so, Father, right now, I just thank you for every person here. Yeah, the Lord is saying to me right now, you know, are you here? Just, just with every eye closed, just for a minute. You're here, and you've got a circumstance where you're literally, the sea is behind you, the mountains are on each side, and the enemy, in a sense, is pursuing you. And that's where you find yourself right now. Just put your hand up, just to the Lord. I see those hands being raised all through the sanctuary. Okay, you can put those hands down. Lord, you saw those hands raised. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I pray that they have clarity to hear what you have to say about the circumstance. That as they lift up the authority that's been given to them, Lord God, that they can speak to the circumstances you direct them, and literally the seas will be parted on their behalf, and you will make a way where there seemeth to be no way. Lord God, I thank you for every person here that's here physically, those watching, those who will watch in days and weeks and months and years to come. The Lord God, that the relevancy of this message will impact them and they will begin to walk in the authority that's been passed down to us as children of the Most High God. I thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. God bless you this morning.